So let's start this story where it ended. On May 20th, 1898, Thomas Nulty, the butcher of Rodden, hung from a public gallows just outside of the courthouse in Joliet, Quebec. It was said that he faced his death without fear or emotion, and he swung from the gallows for 13 minutes before he was declared dead. Now, Tom was the eldest of nine children. They were a family that lived on a farm just north of Rodden, out in the woods. The father was Michael Nulty, he was Irish, and his mother was Emily Ricard, who was Canadian, and his siblings were Elizabeth, Annie, Patrick, Helen, Mary, Marguerite, Judith, and Catherine. Father Bayergé, who was the priest of Rodden, went to visit the Nulties quite often, and he reported uh, that they were a godless, illiterate, savage family living out there in the woods. As for Tom, it was said that he was quite a quite lazy man, as he was allergic to work. Uh, he did small jobs here and there, but he didn't have much of a career. It was said that was, this was caused by the epilepsy that he had, or jumping Frenchman syndrome, as it was called in the day. But if Thomas had any kind of reputation, it was that as a dancer and a musician. It was said that he was a very good dancer, he would, and he loved to socialize, he loved to go to celebrations, and he would go there to dance. Uh, and then once he had had enough dancing, he would rest, he'd pull out his fiddle, and play his music for others to inspire them to dance. Now in 1897, Thomas fell in love with a woman named Rosa L'Esperance. In fact, he asked her to marry him. Now there's no record of Rosa actually accepting the proposal. She liked Thomas well enough, but she wouldn't accept it. Neither would she reject it. She just preferred to keep his hope alive. But for Thomas, this was an acceptance. And so he was making plans to be married. He went to see his family, his parents, and explained to them that he was getting married and that his intention that he, would, was he, that he and his wife would move in to the farm with his parents. But his parents looked at him and said, are you crazy? We barely make enough money to feed the children in the house already. And now you're going to bring in this strange woman into our lives and we're going to have to feed and clothe her. And then of course the two of you will probably have children and we're going to have to feed your children as well. There's just not enough money to feed the children we already have. And they refused to accept his proposition. Now, Thomas, of course, was not happy with this. Uh, he went to his sisters and he went to family and friends and uh, tried to get their support. But they also told him that it wasn't realistic. There wasn't enough money in the house. And Thomas didn't make enough money from the odd jobs that he took uh, to be able to afford this life. And so they wouldn't support him. So Thomas decided that if there were too many mouths to feed in that house, well, then those mouths would have to go. Two days before the murder, Thomas decided to go visit his sister, who lived in uh, Waxford, which was two and a half miles north of Chertsey. He spent two days with her and her husband, and then on the Thursday, he left in the morning at 10 o'clock and walked home. By noon, he arrived on the farm. He went and changed his clothes, found himself an axe, and he began to hunt for his siblings. Now, Elizabeth was the first to die. She was in the barn doing her chores. She saw Thomas walking towards her, but because he had the axe hidden behind his back, she thought nothing of it, and she continued to work. Thomas came up behind her, lifted the axe, and brought it down so hard on her neck, he nearly took her head off. She never saw death coming. She fell to the ground dead instantly and lay there in a pool of her own blood. Now, Thomas noticed that Annie was walking towards the barn, so he hid himself in the shadows and he waited. Annie came into the barn when she saw the body of her sister lying in a pool of her own blood. She screamed and ran for the house, and that's when Thomas started to run after her, brandishing the axe. He caught up with her, and he, be, he raised the axe, and she begged him not to kill her, but he brought the axe down and butchered her right there in the yard. In the house, Patrick and Helen watched as Thomas cut down their sister in the yard of that farm, and they cried out. Thomas, of course, heard them, and he made his way down to the house to take care of them. But they barricaded the door and prevented him from coming in. He pounded on that door, demanding that he be let in, but they wouldn't let him in. And so Thomas took the axe, and he began to hack, 
hack away at that door, splintering it, calling out and saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Eventually, he destroyed the door, and when he did, Patrick and Helen ran to opposite ends of the house, trying to find a place to hide. But Thomas knew that house like the back of his hand. He quickly hunted them both down, and while they begged for their lives, he butchered them with that axe. When he was done, he changed his clothes, he got rid of the axe, and then he walked into the woods. And he went to see Rosa, who lived on the Beaudry farm just on the other side of the forest. When he arrived at around 6 o'clock, Rosa said that he looked upset, but he insisted that there was nothing wrong. He stayed there until 10, and then he made his way back to his home. In the meantime, his parents came home and found their children murdered on the farm, so they immediately called the police. Detective McCaskill was put on the case. If At first, uh, McCaskill suspected a vagabond that had been seen in the area, but his suspicions quickly turned to Thomas, because Thomas was acting strangely. He seemed preoccupied and nervous. On the day of the funeral, while they were, the children were buried in a pauper's grave because the family didn't have enough money uh, to pay for a proper burial, and as soon as the funeral was done, McCaskill arrested Thomas and brought him down to the police station, and they questioned him at length. Now, Thomas said that he was, he was innocent of the crime, but as they questioned him, he kept changing his story, little details were uh, different, and eventually McCaskill accused him of the murder, and he was sent uh, to Joliet Prison. After being there for a couple of days, eventually Thomas confessed to the murder of his siblings. He swore that he acted alone and with premeditation. Now, when the crime hit the papers, La Presse referred to Thomas Nulty as the Butcher of Rodden, and concerned citizens took out a full-page ad in the newspaper calling for his public lynching. That's when the police put Thomas into protective custody. In December 1897, he was charged with murder, and in January 1898, that's when his trial began. Now, because my money was tight, Michael Nulty had to sell his ch children's uh, possessions, including a door that was stained with their blood to the Musée Eden for $10 to pay for the lawyers. He hired De Salaberry and Archer, and they pled the case that Thomas was not guilty due to insanity, which was caused by his epilepsy, or the jumping Frenchman syndrome. They brought in two experts to testify to this, but the plaintiffs brought in three experts that debunked this idea. Uh, once, uh, then even uh, Father uh, Bayerger came in and testified for three hours on behalf of Thomas Nulty. He reported uh, that after multiple visits that the family was godless, illiterate, and lived a savage life because they knew nothing of God. He questioned Elizabeth. She stated she didn't know who created heaven or earth. She knew nothing of the Christian God, and she even suggested that there were multiple gods. Father Bayerger even cited that Emilie Ricard, Thomas's mother, was a horrible dancer in her youth, and that her skills had not improved after her marriage, which was surely a sign of poor character and would have had an influence on Thomas. In this environment, Father Bayerger stated it was un inevitable that Thomas would not give in to his savage nature. Once the lawyers had made their case and rested, the jury deliberated for only a couple of minutes and they decided that Thomas was guilty of murder. When the judge turned and delivered his sentence to Thomas, he asked him if he had any final words. And it was in court. Even though Thomas had confessed to the crime to the police, in court, Thomas stated that he was not the murderer, that he had no reason to uh, kill his siblings and that he had not done this horrible crime. Because he stated this in court, there is a conspiracy theory that states that maybe that Michael Nulty, the father, uh, was the one who had tried to destroy his family doing, in doing so uh, to get rid of this life that he led that he did not enjoy. But there's no proof of that to this very day. So Thomas Nulty was charged with murder uh, in February 1898, and he was sentenced to hang in May 1898. So on May 20th, 1898, over 1,500 people gathered right here at the courthouse to see Thomas Nulty hang. They made so much noise, they were laughing and jeering at Nulty 
that Radcliffe, the executioner, lodged a formal complaint with the magistrate because he felt like the solemnity of this event was being ruined by the circus that the people were generating. On the day of his death, Thomas Nulty wrote two letters, one to his parents to apologize for what he had done, and the second letter he wrote to a childhood friend, Madame Levesque, uh, and he simply said goodbye and asked her to pray for him. When it came time, there was a procession that left the courthouse. Sher Sheriff Rivard was at the front, followed by uh, Father Geoffrey with cross in hand, then Thomas Nulty, who was bound, but he was able to walk freely, and behind him were his, uh, his lawyers, uh, de Salaberry and Archer. It was said that Thomas Nulty faced his execution without emotion or without remorse, without fear. He walked up to the gallows and, and uh, Radcliffe threw the ropes over the crossbeam and placed Thomas over the newly installed double doors of the gallows. Thomas took one final look at the crowd and they put a hood over his head and a noose around his neck and at 9.01 on that day, May 20th, Thomas Nulty hung for his crimes. He swung there for 13 minutes before he was declared dead. And that is the tragic end of Thomas Nulty, the Butcher of Rodden.